Hello, everybody. L.C. Holt here, and this is my update for the week of January the 27th. Today, we got a big show about a big life, Howard Hughes. So let me introduce uh, my guests on the show, helping me talk about it, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, Ryan, Ray, Nick, how you doing, man? Hey, what's up? I cut my face off. <laughs> and, we, and you have the, the tissue to show it. Um, yeah, it was bad. It was much worse five minutes ago, so we were Howard, making progress making progress. Howard would have hated that. He's a germaphobe, you know. Uh, Rebecca Ivey, as usual, you're here with me. Yep, hello. <laughs> so let's talk about Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is a man of mystery, and the mystery goes back to the, his very inception because there is a lot of contrivancy about when he was even born. He tells one story, and baptism records tell another story. Uh, according to him, he was born December 24th of 1905. Now, according to the record of his baptism, he was born September 24th of 1905. So it's a matter of just a few months. Either way, he was born in 1905. So it's either September or Christmas Eve. Who knows? Um, now, he was born to uh, a wealthy father, Howard uh, Robart Hughes Sr., who became wealthy as the owner of the Hughes Tool Company because he had invented during the oil boom in Texas, a special kind of drill bit that allowed you to basically drill through anything. A two cone- Armageddon. <laughs> exactly, it looked like that. It was like two coned and it rolled and it had all these blades on it and you could get through anything. Um, so this made him a millionaire. Uh, his mother, Howard's mother was a woman named uh, Aileen. And at a young age, Howard himself started to show an aptitude toward engineering and mathematics. Um, in fact, Howard Hughes was the first person in Houston to build a wireless ham radio transmitter. There are so many reasons I believe that. <laughs> he, was eight, he was 11 years old when he did that. And then a year later, he took spare steam engine parts and made a motorized bicycle. So he was shooting around the neighborhood on this thing. Awesome. How, Howard Listening even from, to that and playing that loud music. <laughs> I tell you, Howard, even from a young age, had a need for speed because he loved things that went fast. Be careful. In fact, in fact, he took his first flying lesson when he was 14, which is something that would later become a passion of his, aviation, and we'll get into that later. His mother died Howard was going to have either a brother or a sister, we're not sure, but Aileen was pregnant in 1922 with a sibling. The pregnancy went wrong, and she died, and the baby died. And then two years after that, Howard Sr. died of a heart attack, which instantly Howard became heir to this million-dollar fortune. Um, he withdrew. He was At the time, he was going to Rice University. But he withdrew after his father's death. And he still maintained connections to Rice because he actually married uh, Ella Botts Rice, who is the granddaughter of the guy the school is named after. She, too, came from a wealthy family. Now, Howard's uncle was a, was a guy named Rupert Hughes, uh, the father's brother. And he was very well known as a playwright and as an author. Rupert Hughes actually wrote what is considered the definitive three-volume biography of George Washington. And he went on to write a lot of biographies like that. But he also wrote films. So by the time uh, Howard married his wife in June of 1925, Rupert had already written over two dozen silent movies in Hollywood. And so Howard gets interested in this. And he's like, you know, my uncle is out there making movies. I would like to make movies myself. And I suddenly have all this money. The last thing he really wanted to do was sell drill bits or have anything to do with the tool company. But he had all the income coming from the tool company. So he decided to move himself and his wife into the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, and they would become a Hollywood couple. Um, now, the ambassador later became famous for something other than Howard Hughes living there when he was a young man, you know, with the, uh, that's where Bobby Kennedy was, was murdered. But, but that's where Howard started his film career. And he wound up producing 
four independent silent films. Because remember, this is in the 20s, so we're in the silent film era. Um, the first one was a bit of a flop that has been lost to time. No one has this first film. It was a movie called Swell Hogan. Um, but then he did a... Sounds uh, well. That sounds well, doesn't it? He did a couple other things, one called Every, uh, Everybody's Acting and one called Two Arabian Nights. Both of those were comedies. And he did a movie called The Racket and The Front Page. And then th those were all as producer. So he would hire someone else to direct it and write it. But Howard liked control. And he got this idea that what if I just directed my next movie? So he decided to produce and... Yeah, exactly. Total control. He decided to produce and direct a movie called Hell's Angels, which he was going to make into the definitive war epic. It took many, many years of, of hard work to make this film. In fact, a year and a half into shooting, he had only finished half of it. That had to be so hard for everyone working on it. Especially like these guys who were... Because Howard basically wanted to do real-life dogfights and shoot them not with any special effects. He wanted to put cameras on planes and fly the planes mm -hmm. so that you're actually in the air having dogfights and you're just going to film it. Obviously, they're not shooting at each other. They're using blanks, but everything else is real. Um, Today, I'm sure, they would not be insured for that. <laughs> absolutely not. And this was also before <laughs> the uh, production code came about, the censors. So Hell's Angels is one of the first movies that have things like Son of a Bitch, because people are like, Son of a Bitch, God damn it, and all this stuff, for Christ's sake. Uh, because, by the way, the reason you could hear them is because halfway through shooting this, Howard decided that these talkies are coming into play. We should, we should make this not a silent film, but we should have dialogue in it. See, if he had it together, he'd have de developed the talkie. He would have done the, the, the James Cameron thing, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but uh, when they decided to introduce dialogue into the movie, the star of it was Norwegian. Now, in the silent film era, you could be whatever nationality you wanted, but you, could you have, couldn't. You could you even could, have a terrible voice. <laughs> that's right. And apparently she did, according to Howard, because he fired her off the movie because she had a thick Norwegian accent. And he hired an 18-year-old girl named Jean Harlow to replace her. Uh, because Gene Harlow did not speak with an accent. This was Gene Harlow's first film. And he also hired a director named James Whale to direct the uh, talkie scenes. And James Whale would later become famous for directing the first Frankenstein movie. Um, so Howard just concentrated on the aerial, the action stuff, what you would call nowadays second unit. You know, everything that involved the stunt, planes and everything. Um, now... There was one particular scene he wanted to have a plane dive bombing down toward the ground. And then he wanted it to have to pull up in this sharp, steep maneuver. And the, the guy who was the head uh, pilot said, there's no way you can do that. You're going to crash. Like, I'm not having any of my guys doing that. And so he started to do that. And so Howard basically said, fuck it, I'll do it. You're saying it can't be done. I'll do it. So he flew the plane down in this steep thing, and when he tried to do the pullout, he crashed the plane. <laughs> so the pilot was actually right. Um, advice is overrated. Advice is definitely overrated, and Howard's <laughs> not listening to any of it. This was the first of several facial surgeries Howard had to, to go through. Now, this is not in the famous um, Martin Scorsese movie, The Aviator, which is great, but they left that part kind of out that he actually crashed a plane. <laughs> <laughs> because he wasn't. Um, something else I don't know if they mentioned, uh, four of the other pilots died during the filming of that movie in various crashes and accidents. Uh, because, like I they said... Probably just, they, they probably just felt like, look, we've got so many other scenes where he crashes planes, we'll just not say, say anything about that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then you also had a hundred and... He hired 137 pilots for this movie. It's a like year for flight. <laughs> so it's amazing that only four of them died, frankly. <laughs> you know, the stuff he wanted. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, the movie came out, and it, it was, at the time, the most expensive movie ever made until Ben-Hur, which later cost $4 million. This movie cost $3 million. 
and it made its money back. Everybody said it was going to be a financial disaster. They were like, and how, and how much were movies back then, considering? You mean to to like a ticket price? Oh, a ticket price. Yeah, I mean, geez, I mean, the, the to idea make of that making, money to make three million dollars back was a big deal. So it was actually a huge hit, even though it kind of just broke even, but it shouldn't have even rationally even broke even, you know. Um, now, he went on and he, he directed a lot of other things. Uh, he produced more, actually, than he directed. Uh, Scarface, the original Scarface, he produced. Uh, the Outlaw, which is famous because it starred Gene Russell. Jane Russell. Jane Russell had this... She had her cleavage, and he wanted it to be higher, so Howard invented the first wonder bra to push her breasts up so they would, they would stick out more. Um, memories. And, yeah, the memories, yeah. And uh, this caused uh, more problem with the production code, which I think they were, by this point, it had been established. So, like, the early version of the rating system, saying what you could do and what you couldn't. They had a problem with Gene Har or with um, Jane Russell's breasts sticking out, and they also had a problem with the violence in Scarface. Because Scarface, for its time, is a very violent movie, but it's about gangsters shooting each other in the streets. So, you know, it's kind of understandable, I guess. Um, now, in 1948, he continued his movie business by basically silently buying up shares in RKO, which was a major film studio that was on the decline. They owned not only a studio, but a chain of theaters, which now gave him the movie theaters in order to show the movies in, and a number of radio stations. So he bought everything that was associated with RKO. And... Already, he was getting very detail-oriented about things. Like, for instance, he had everyone that worked for RKO taken into a room and screened by basically interrogated to see <laughs> to see to see what their political leaning. Was. Sounds like my last. I, I, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he wanted to make sure that you know this was again in the time of like communism and the Red Scare and shit. So he wanted to make sure there was not going to be any problem with any of his, not only the actors in his films, but also so, the people that actually like the typists, everybody that worked with RKO. So I have a question. So when he bought up all the theaters, did he have to, he could just show his movies or was the code on his butt about showing movies? Or was he like, well, I own a studio and I own the theaters. I'm going to show them in my theaters. Well, he might have been like that, but technically, if it, it, nothing could be exhibited without the code approval. So okay. if he did, he wasn't supposed to, but that doesn't mean he didn't do it. <laughs> and wouldn't that just be kind of like impossible, though? Because like without the content, you know, you, you can't produce all the content, especially back at that time. You know what I yeah. mean? Like with the, with the amount of time a movie took to make, like if you didn't have other movies coming in, then your theater's not doing any business. You're right. And it's it's worth noting, too, Ryan, that you pointed that out. RKO made like 30 movies a year prior to him buying it. When he bought it, he said that every movie we're going to do is going to be great. So they went like from making 30 movies a year to making eight movies a year. They so did, they, they did all the Fred Astaire movies back in back then. In the 30s. That's right. Yeah, RKO. Like so, probably Fred Astaire was in most of their movies at a certain point because they were making much, much fewer films. Um, now, eventually, he totally bought everything having to do with RKO for twenty-four million dollars. But in nineteen fifty-four, he had sort of tired of RKO, so it basically, as soon as he bought every share in the company, he promptly sold it to the General Tire and Rubber Company for $25 million. So he made a profit of $1 million. And he sold them everything RKO except for the films that he produced. He retained all rights to every film that he produced under RKO. But everything else, you know, they got. And then sadly, the, you know, the General Tire and Rubber Company wasn't really interested in making movies. <laughs> so for a Can while- you believe it? Yeah, yeah right? So, I mean, like, for a while, they sold it to TV, like, TV rights, and then the, the RKO just fell to pieces. Like, in 1957, it was gone. You know, there's no RKO left. Um, but by this point, Howard wanted to focus on aviation. So he had sort of moved out of the Hollywood uh, sphere of interest. Um, he was already designing uh, planes. In fact, while he was making movies, he designed several aircraft. 
I set a land speed record in 1935 for piloting a plane that he designed called the Hughes H1 Racer. And he piloted over a test field in Santa Ana, California, and broke this, the speed, the air speed record. He went 352 miles per hour, which had never been done before, and actually was never done again in a plane that was designed and built by an individual. Uh, after that, all the air speed records were made by planes that were designed by corporations or groups or some sort of a sponsored thing. He had, he built the uh, H1 Racer. Um, it's pretty impressive. It is impressive. And like I said, that was 1935. People here in, people here in Vegas aren't doing that. No, like nowadays... <laughs> Nowadays, anything like that that happens is sponsored, you know, by Red Bull or something. You know, as say as as Ryan takes it. I promise, I promise you, we did not plan that. Um, now, 1938 broke another record. He flew around the world in three days, which is four days less than the last record. So he he shattered the record pretty much. Um, he did that. It wasn't in a plane that he designed. It was in a Lockheed. Um, but he only had a four-man crew. He had himself, not counting him, uh, other than it was five if you count him. He had himself. He piloted it, of course. You know, he's going to pilot it. He had a co-pilot, a navigator, an engineer, and a mechanic, and they flew around the world. Say, and did it. That's what uh, Amelia, well, Amelia Earhart flew in a Lockheed. Yes. He was, uh, Hughes was a very, um, he loved Lockheeds. And later on, when we get further into the um, aviation, he preferred like to buy for his airline and stuff, which he owned later, we'll get to. He preferred Lockheed's um, for the most part. Um, and he was very, you know, discriminating in his taste. So I guess they must have been a pretty damn good airplane. Um, now, in 1939, he started to design and build prototypes for the U.S. Army. Um, because they were impressed with his aviation skills, the, the H-1 racer, and the flight around the world. And so he started to design reconnaissance planes secretly for the military. The first was called the Hughes uh, D-2. And it was, it was actually conceived as a bomber, but then later it was turned into a reconnaissance plane. I, and, I, I, and, I wish I could have been him, though, when they came to him just to be like a smart ass. Like, oh, you're impressed. You mean you mean you're not really like, impressed with those like 40 other people who do this? Like, uh, oh, right. I'm the only one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Fuck off. That's right. <laughs> and the, the, the weird I mean, thing. He had all the negotiating power in the world back then. Like he had no, like nothing, no competition. And what was uh, interesting about Hughes is that even with these military contracts, he insisted on putting a lot of his own money into the design of these things. Mm -hmm. um, I think, which ultimately we'll get to eventually, but that actually saved his ass later it on. It did. Because he yeah. was saying that, you know, you're not, I'm not just taking money from the government. I'm putting my own money into these things because he was so obsessed with it being right. Right. Yes. He, <laughs> he actually didn't think. A lot of times he didn't think the government was giving them enough money to design the planes. So he was like, well, you won't give me the money. I'll just spend my own money and we're going to do the fucking thing right. <laughs> With basically, you know, the attitude. Um, well, he's probably like, my name's going to be on this. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was. I mean, like I said, it was the, the first um, reconnaissance plane he designed was the Hughes D2. And the second one he designed was the Hughes uh, XF. 11, which is kind of infamous because this is the reconnaissance plane that he was piloting on the prototype he was piloting on July 7th, 1948. And he got an oil leak as he was flying over Los Angeles. And it caused one of the propellers to reverse rotation. For some reason, this oil leak caused the propeller to reverse its pitch. And the plane. Possible. I guess so. Uh, wow. I would not think it would have anything to do with it, but that's what happened when he was midair and this thing started to yaw to one side and lose altitude and with Hughes in it because obviously he liked to pilot his own prototype. I was going to say, and also how many guys who fund their own planes would get, actually get in the plane and fly it or they would yeah. let him get in the plane and fly it. That's right. And Hughes is always insisting on it. He's like, get out of the way. I'm, I'm flying this plane. <laughs> I guess he, he, he probably would have flown it in the war, too, if he could. Yeah, I'll show you how to do it. Um, 
But he tried to land this plane at the Beverly Hills Country Club. And <laughs> um, he tried to land it on the fairway. Because, again, this is a very, this is a very Howard Hughes sort of a thing. Um, Gonna have the best life. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is that, I think there's water in here. Whoa, that's, that's... Yeah, where's that what? <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, there's a waterfall in my room. Um, but what I was saying before was what happened was he tried to land at the Beverly Hills Country Club. And as he was coming down at the Country Club fairway, he didn't make it. He didn't. He didn't clear the country club. And so what he did was he his the wing of his plane, this uh, XF11, sheared through three houses in Beverly Hills, and just kept going and crashed into Beverly Hills, and burst into flames. Now Hughes managed to pull himself out of the wreckage, but <laughs> the problem was he had smashed his collarbone. He crushed the left side of his chest. Uh, it collapsed along. He shoved his heart into the other side of his chest cavity. And he had ripped his upper lip totally off. It was just hanging there. And this is why the most important person involved isn't supposed to fly the plane. <laughs> exactly. That's why the, the money man and the designer never flies the plane. God. Uh, Oh, and he was covered in, thir in like third degree burns, too, because he climbed out of the fire, but not before catching fire. Uh, now, the, the torn off lip, if you notice uh, pictures of, of, of Howard past which, a certain point, wait a minute, he always was not featured in the film. The torn off lip? <laughs> yes. No, I don't think that was really featured, but he wore a mustache <laughs> for the and majority. Leo was like, look, they're going to give me the Oscar later. Just, just, I'm not going to go that far this one. <laughs> right. DiCaprio with his lip hanging on. That's but right. That's right. If you ever notice in the in the movie uh, or or in actual photographs, he wore a mustache. The reason he wore a mustache was to cover the scar where they where they you know sewed his lip back on. Um, they they basically said this recovery was absolutely miraculous. Uh, now, famously after this, the War Production Board contacted him about design. <laughs> I'm sure they said, you're not going to fly it, but we need to design something. <laughs> um, a, a plane that they wanted to be a cargo plane, so not reconnaissance anymore. And Hughes had this idea where he was going to build the biggest cargo plane that the military has ever had. And he was going to make it totally out of wood. The only metal in it was going to be the uh, flying instrumentation, Right. So uh -huh. I think he might have lost Ryan. But uh, if he comes back, I will tell him that the name of this plane uh, was the Hercules. It was a cargo transport yes. plane. It was called the Spruce Goose. Well, yes, eventually <laughs> it was called the Spruce Goose. That's right. Much to um, his dismay. He hated the fact that they called it the Spruce Goose. That, that was his detractors that wanted to like put him down. Um, because eventually he had a lot of detractors because this was famous because it's, he spent a lot of money making the Hercules slash Spruce Goose. Uh, $22 million he was spent designing this thing, and it took so long that the war had been... Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, man. You're back. Can you see me now? Yes, you're there. Okay. Um, so after, tw after the entire duration of the war... The Spruce Goose was finally finished when it was no longer needed. Um, this led to the Senate War Investigation Committee, which interrogated Howard Hughes on film, which you can watch, about why it took so many years and $22 million to make a plane that hasn't flown. And Hughes's response was, well, we've been trying to make it fly. We want it to be done right. And basically, what are you complaining about? Because most of that money was my money because you didn't give me enough. So I spent more money. And he said, yeah. you know, that his whole um, reputation was wrapped up in this plane succeeding. Now, the plane, like I said, was kind of useless because it was <laughs> the war had ended. So it only flew one time. But Howard wanted to yeah. fly yeah. it through. That he just leave that off, Rebecca, for a minute. <laughs> Howard wanted to fly it to prove that it would fly, right? So he flew it one time. He flew it for one mile 
70 feet over the river on November 2nd, 1947. And that was the only time the Hercules slash Bruce Goose ever flew. But he did prove it would fly. So if you go to Long Beach, California, you can see the Spruce Goose. And it's, you know, sitting there in, in, on, in Long Beach on display. I remember when I lived out there, uh, there's a road near Los Angeles called like Spruce Goose Way or something. And I remember seeing the road sign and thinking, like Howard would fucking hate that because, you know, you never, you never said Spruce Goose around him when you were referring to the Hercules. That was a big no-no. Um, so around this time, Howard, this was around 1939 or so, Howard started to buy up shares in TWA. And again, going back to Lockheed, he became really interested in the Lockheed Constellation. And he started buying all kinds of Lockheed Constellations for TWA. Because he basically wanted to have a plane that would fly people, your average Joe, around the world for very little money. Um, affordable transcontinental flights. Now, he ran TWA, which was a very popular co company, until 1960. And he was forced out of that by basically the board, uh, more, more even than the board, by the bank. Because the bank told the board, listen, he's buying up all these constellations. He's been spending a whole lot of money, $400 million in developing various planes for this airline. We think he's more of a liability than he is uh, anything else. So if you remove him from management, we'll consider giving you more money for your airline. But he can stay on, but he can't manage the company anymore, says the bank. And so that's how Howard kind of lost his job at TWA in terms of the management position. Um, he sold back all the shares and he made an incredible amount of money, like almost half a billion dollars he made when he sold back his TWA shares. Thank so he didn't live through the 2008 derivative crisis. He would have himself in even more insane. He's like, let me get this straight. I can't spend four hundred million, but you guys can bet two point four quadrillion. Okay. Ask yeah. Me. Yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's unbelievable, man. Uh, I, I would like to and know. What, what do you think he was doing with the money? Like having fun? Like he's? I don't understand people. Like even even the bankers. Like what do you think he's doing? You know, like I I don't know. Like looking back, like he was. Billions of dollars left alone. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing about Howard. It's not like he wasn't doing anything with all this money. I mean, he was making a whole lot of dough for the company, but he was also spending it in order to make more because, again, you're advancing the whole thing. You know, you're doing more things, you're making more uh, developments in this sort do of you know, Do you know yes. how many patents he held? Oh, he held a lot. Yeah, because, I mean, he even went so far, he, he designed the shocks for what you use on modern helicopters for when they come down and land, because he thought helicopters landed too sharply. So he wanted shocks to soften the landing. The many things. Um, he was into aerospace development, too, satellites. Like what we know of now as DirecTV, a lot of the early patents were his ideas for satellite television. All the stuff he was working on, like during that time frame, and the things we hadn't developed yet during that time frame, like it could have been the most valuable, like amongst the most valuable collection of patents. There's no yeah with all the stuff he was working. On. Well, going what, back to the to what you were saying, so much money, but go ahead, Rebecca. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, when you're talking about how much money he's spending, but you know, the old saying is, you got to spend money to make money. Right. Exactly. And, when, exactly. and when you think about like the four hundred million dollars that he was spending during his time, during his tenure at, at uh, TWA, that was not only the um, plane development, but that was also with the aerospace, because all of that by that point was in one thing. So that was having to do with satellites, with helicopters, with planes, with all all the stuff having to do with the uh, the, the Hughes airline, <laughs> you know, yeah. Hughes aircrafts rather. Now. You know, his marriage to Ella fell apart back in the Hollywood days because Howard was very promiscuous. Um, three, 
<laughs> right. He did a lot of starlets, and we won't even get into that because that's like a whole show unto itself. We will run out of time talking about Howard Hughes. How did he find the time? <laughs> I don't know. He was a very busy man. But uh, three years prior to him getting kicked out of TWA by the bank, he married a woman named Jean Peters, who was his second wife and ultimately kind of his last wife. She was an actress that he met back in the Hollywood days years prior. And he decided to marry her. Because, as I was saying, during his TWA years, when he was spending all this money, other things were going down. And he began to get paranoid about the people around him, which maybe he would have a right to be paranoid about the board of TWA, <laughs> because they did ultimately you know, listen to the bank and boot him. Um, but he was paranoid about people in his close circle trying to take him out of the leadership position of this company he had built because of certain behavior which had started in the 50s. Uh, in the 40s to some degree, but primarily in the 50s, not long after his plane crash, his, his really bad one. Um, he married Gene Peters because what he decided was that I want someone who has the, the power of attorney who can tell these people if they want to try and commit me I'm not going to be committed. So he felt like his inner circle was going to team up on him and have him committed as a crazy person. But if he married this woman, she would be his wife and they would have to go through her. And he paid her tons of money, bought her houses, gave her $70,000 a year, all just to function as his wife. And they only communicated by telephone. So this wasn't like a... a yeah, what a gig, right? I mean, this wasn't an actual marriage. This was like a marriage literally by convenience uh, with a lot of money involved. Um, now, I guess we'll talk about some of the things that he was paranoid about uh, people pointing out. Early in the 40s and stuff, he got into this mode, which isn't all that unusual, but he started to like get obsessed about certain foods. Like for dinner every night, he always ate a New York strip steak and cooked medium rare, dinner salad, and peas every night for dinner. But after, after a certain point, though, he started to get paranoid about the size of the peas. So he refused to eat anything, any small peas. He would, he would judge the size of the pea. And if the pea was deemed too small, he would push it off to the side of the plate and he would only eat the large peas. He was a pea man. Um, for breakfast, he always ate eggs. But nobody could make eggs for him except for his own chef, Lily. He had to take Lily everywhere or else he wouldn't be able to eat breakfast because she made eggs the way he liked it. And as it now being persnickety about your food isn't necessarily something that's going to make you crazy. Like that to me does not strike me as being particularly, I mean, eccentric people, you know, it's just high maintenance. <laughs> it's high maintenance. Yeah. Now you can start getting into some of the other things. Like I said, that was in the forties and even back in the thirties, he, he had developed this tick where, and there's some actual footage of him uh, like with his planes and stuff where you can see it, where he would, tug on this on the pant leg his pant leg it was always the left pant leg and he would tug on it twice and for some reason he just it made him feel better like every so often he would have to tug his pant leg twice so it's like ocd behavior now as he got older and into the 50s he started having a lot of problems with this um there was one incident in 1958, this was a year after he married Gene Peters for fear that he was going to get committed by his inner circle, when he went into a screening room to watch some movies and he refused to come out. And he refused to come out for four months. He spent four months in this screening room watching movies and the movies could never stop. So whoever the projectionists were, I guess they just rotated them out. He would only eat chocolate bars and chicken, and he would only drink milk. How's that for a diet, huh? He threw off the steaks for this four months and the, and the scrambled eggs. Um, no and, vegetables. No, no vegetables. Chocolate <laughs> bars and chicken. And they had to be. <laughs> and he wrote up this long 
memo telling him telling his people how to deliver the food to him. They had to walk in the door backwards with their arm out behind them and walk toward him until he and then stop when he told them to. And then he would take the food and then they would have to walk forward back out of the room. You weren't allowed to look at him or to speak to him. If he spoke to you and asked a question, that was OK. You could reply. Otherwise, don't look at him and don't talk to him. Probably part of the reason of this is because he took all his clothes off when he was in there. So he was butt ass naked in this screening room. And he asked for Kleenex boxes, a lot of Kleenex boxes. And as he was watching these films over and over again, he would stack these Kleenex boxes. And then he would knock them down because the stack didn't look right. And so he became obsessed for months with stacking these Kleenex boxes in just the right way. Maybe he just needed some projects. <laughs> he, I, I guess a lot of people consider this to be, for some reason, like a, a real emotional meltdown of his. Uh, I don't see why. <laughs> right. It's totally normal behavior. You know, it's definitely extreme OCD behavior, that's for sure. Um, but hey, eventually he came out. After four months, he decided he was done. He put his clothes back on and he came out. He was, you know, full four months worth of beard growth and hair growth and fingernails. None of that. He didn't bathe for four months. And he pissed into jars. For, for someone that was so germaphobic, you know. Yeah. yeah to be, uh, that's gross. And, and did you leave the jars, jars in there, or would you take them away? Well, still, also, did is he have like forty jars hands? stacked like on equal terms with the Kleenex? I'm sure that the jars were like perfectly organized did, next to the Kleenex. I don't know what he wanted to do, what he did with his shit. Don't ask me that. I was gonna say, did he not wash his hands during that time? Because that's germ. That is gross. That is. He didn't bathe. Go. That's called you know seeing happy birthday twice while you wash your hands to make sure you get all the poop off. No, he didn't wash his hands for four months. That, like I say, he eventually came out, and then. But then again, he didn't have probably didn't have much fiber because he wasn't eating any vegetables. It was just chicken and chocolate. Chicken and chocolate <laughs> and milk. Yeah, he was drinking plenty of milk. Now, yes. after he came out of the screening room, he went into a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, <laughs> and he stayed there for a while. And he didn't wear any clothes. Uh, while he was in the bungalow, he took his clothes off again, and he would sit there with a napkin over his crotch. Um, and at this point, Jean Peters lived with him for this time in the bungalow, so I'm sure she was having a blast. Um, didn't he have a um, Didn't he have a bad pill problem at this point? Yes. He was taking like we taking like three different substances to like uh, keep him going. Yeah, he was. He really got hooked on codeine after that. After the plane crash that ripped crash. his leg off, which I think it's important to point to point out. He's kind of stoned, like in one way or another, this, this entire time. And then was that the period where he really got like bad, or was it after that? No, it was. Um, it, it was. Uh, he was already stoned a lot with codeine during the screening room incident. And also after, you know, after basically that plane crash, this was in 58, that plane crash was in the 40s. So he, he had been on codeine for a while and he would inject it into himself uh, when he felt like he needed it. He also, the people have also pointed out that he might have had this thing called complex regional pain syndrome, which is nerve damage caused by these crashes. And basically what it is, is a sensitivity to touch. So one reason he might have taken his clothes off a lot is because it might have hurt him because people who have this sometimes their nerves are damaged to such an extent that even the feel of fabric against their skin is painful well, also he 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 was burnt badly burned in these crashes yes so i mean yeah. skin grafts i mean i know someone that had was burned and they had skin grafts you know yeah it's not you know the most fun it's yeah. the worst thing that can happen to you. Yeah. And one of the things about it is, uh, you know, pointing this out, it, there could have been some legitimate reasons for some of the behavior. I mean, obviously, he's, he's, his OCD is getting insane. But anyway, lived at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Then in, uh, in 1966, on Thanksgiving Day, he decided to take his ass to Vegas. And he moved into the Desert Inn in Las Vegas, and he rented out 
the top two floors. The eighth floor, he rented out for his uh, employees to work. It was going to be like the nerve center of his organization. And then the ninth floor, which was the penthouse, he made his personal residence. Uh, after a certain point, the Desert Inn asked when he was going to leave, and so he bought it. Because uh, he really <laughs> liked living at the Desert Inn, and he stayed there for quite some time. Uh, and he bought up a lot of Las Vegas. He went on a buy-in spree because he up from that penthouse where he hardly ever came out because this is getting into the point now where he's not being seen in public anymore. Uh, but he's still there hanging out and he looks out his window and he sees the castaway and he buys that. And he sees the new frontier and he buys that. He sees the landmark hotel and casino, buys that. He sees the sands, he buys the sands. He basically buys whatever he sees outside his window that he likes. He ends up, ends up buying a lot of the casinos in Vegas. He even bought one that was called, like a little puny one, called the Small uh, uh, the small Silver Slipper, I think it was called. It was like just some little penny ante casino. But it had a neon slipper outside that blinked, and that blinking really got on his nerves. So he bought it so he could take the neon sign down. <laughs> Uh, I like how he's just buy he bought the hotel because they wouldn't let him, you know, stay buying things just to get his way. Yeah, and there's a lot of stories about the desert. And I know at one point, uh, Howard really liked Baskin Robbins banana nut cream uh, ice cream. Did he buy Baskin Robbins? He didn't buy Baskin Robbins, <laughs> but he did place an order, the largest order that you could place, an individual could place for that a flavor of ice cream, and it was 350 gallons. And as soon as the banana nut ice cream arrived at, in, at the Desert Inn, he decided that he didn't want to, he didn't like that flavor anymore. <laughs> and so the Desert Inn, supposedly for years, at least a year, just gave out banana nut Baskin Robbins ice cream to customers just to get rid of it. And some people say that there is still Baskin Robbins banana nut ice cream in the desert. Um, he also, uh, I, you know, it's kind of interesting at this point in his life. I was telling you about his paranoia, about his inner circle. Well, he started to have this delusion, and we'll call it that, that. Mormon people were the only people he could really trust. <laughs> <laughs> and where he got into this, I don't know. But he had this guy. He got Was into he hanging more... out with the Osmond family? <laughs> I mean, the odd thing about it is you would think he would become a Mormon. But Hughes yeah. actually never became a Mormon. <clears throat> he just got in his head that these Mormons were more trustworthy than the people he he'd had in his business so far. So he insulated himself with what later became known amongst his um, friends as the Mormon Mafia. Uh, and for the rest of his life, he had this quote unquote Mormon Mafia around him all the time. Um, now, I'll tell you, and, and they catered to it. They catered to him all the time, showed him films, got him whatever he wanted. And I'm sure he was happy about that. They're they trying were, to get that, that, that Howard money. I think that's exactly what they were trying to get. Yeah, I think they were trying Leave to get this that. in your wheel. <laughs> well, this would be an interesting thing to get you guys' reaction on. Gene Peters, as Ryan said, is probably the best gig in town, being the wife that's not really a wife to Howard Hughes. She filed for divorce in 1970. Yeah, because she said she hadn't talked to him. She hadn't seen him in years and only talked to him Who occasionally. Who cares? You're getting a check. I know. <laughs> And, you know, Howard always spoke highly of Jean Peters, apparently really was fond of her, even though she wasn't a part of his life. And she, he made sure that after their divorce, she got $70,000 a year for the rest of her life, uh, even after he had died. Can I build a time machine and go back in time? And seduce Howard Hughes? That's right. That's right. Not a bad job being his wife. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Um, now, so by this point, Hughes is living this really isolated life with the Mormons. Uh, he eventually leaves Las Vegas and he goes to Nicaragua. It's kind of sad. Why not? Right? Yeah, because why not? Right? Uh, yeah. He thought it would be more private in Nicaragua, which just with him and his um, Mormon friends. But maybe, maybe he heard about a really good ice cream down there. 
Well, he got down there. And what, what I was saying was kind of sad is that past a certain point, he didn't live in, he never had a home. He yeah. just lived in hotels. Like as soon as he moved out of his little house from, from the screening room into the bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, after that, he never lived in a house. He only lived in hotels. And he would take up a couple floors, usually the top floors. And he would live there. That's what he did in Nicaragua. And he stayed there until an earthquake hit. And he was like, I got to get the hell out of Nicaragua. And so he left and he went uh, to Florida. And eventually he went to the Bahamas and he stayed at the Xanadu, <laughs> at the Xanadu Beach Resort. Once again, hotels, germiest places on earth. He must have had, he must have gone through these places and had them like sprayed Fumigated. down. But then when he lives there, you know, he's not really the most hygienic Clean. person. No. Which is kind of interesting to me about the germophobia, because he's afraid of other people getting near him with germs. But, like, he, he does not. sit in his own filth for months. <laughs> right. That's gross. Yeah. This which is, <laughs> which is he, what, what he did, you know. Um, so the last. That is just, yeah, that's crazy. So in the 70s, the last four years of his life, he lived at the Xanadu Beach Resort in the, Bahama, in the Bahamas. And uh, sadly, Howard died um, on a Learjet. I'm sure a lot of people were sad he died. Probably like yeah. 70, 74, you know, the 70, 80 people just getting 70 grand a month we don't even know about. That's right. He is their he is their bread and butter, you know, and especially the the Mormon mafia around him. I mean, that was their whole life was taking care of him. Uh, it was sort of like, you know, uh, the you know they used to call it the Memphis mafia with Elvis, where he just kept his entourage around him. Except with uh, Hughes, it was just the Mormons. They were his entourage, and they were on the plane with him, uh, April fifth, nineteen seventy six, when he was actually en route from. Um, Mexico. Um, he had gone from Florida to Mexico. He was living in a hotel in Mexico for a short time. And then if he started having uh, health issues. And so they decided to get him on a Learjet and fly him to Houston to the Methodist Hospital in Houston. And Hughes apparently died on the flight to Houston. Now, when they landed, it is pitiful what, what came off of his plane. Because, you know, he had his beard, his hair, his nails, his, his fingernails, his toenails were all grown out. His teeth were rotten. He was, he, you know, he was six foot four. He was a very tall guy and he was 90 pounds. So he was basically skin and bones. He was covered in bed sores. He had obviously been Oh, my God. I just How took that in. 90 pounds. How old was he? Well, he was born in 1905, and it was 1976. Okay. He looked like he was about 100 years old. You can see pictures of him. Uh, it's pretty sad. I mean, he was in such a horrible shape, in fact, that the FBI had to fingerprint the body to make sure that was really Howard Hughes. And that's wow. how they confirmed that it, his identity. Um, they determined that he had died of kidney failure. And he was malnourished. He had, this is really sad, he had broken hypodermic needles under the skin of his arms. He had five of them oh. lodged, lodged under his arms. Because uh, apparently the people who were taking care of him didn't take care of him enough to get rid of the bed sores, nor did they know how to give him injections of codeine because they were breaking the needles off in him. Awesome. Who are, oh, my goodness. So, I, honestly, I think near the end, these people... Were these just are not problems that rich person's supposed to have. No, I mean, and it's a shame because, I mean, here's this guy who could have anything in the world, and he's not eating, he can't get out of bed, he's being given injections by people who are breaking needles off in him. I think, yeah, honestly... All because he existed. Say that again, Ryan? That all our lives are... Better off because he existed. And you yeah, know, all you their. Know. Well, it's, not, it's not that you can really control, not like blaming anybody, but you know, you know, he did that to himself in a way. But other, well, I don't understand if you don't know how to do something and someone's paying you that much, I'll pay you like fifty bucks to tell me how to do it. Why? Why guess? <laughs> you know, like, uh, 
Yeah. I don't know. It's terrible he died like that. Terrible he died like that. Yeah, he it's um funny that he he was so paranoid that people were gonna get him and then the people that he trusted just didn't take care of him. I mean, I don't know how much of a pain in the butt I mean that he resisted, but then there comes a point where obviously he's too weak to resist. So guess what? We start taking care of him. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> what that's that's called elderly abuse and neglect. Well, that, that was one of the things that people that were close to him said. I mean, Noah Dietrich is famous because they worked together for a long time. In the movie, he's played by John C. Riley, and he was Hughes's right hand man up until a certain point, and then Hughes fired him kind of unceremoniously. And then after that, he surrounded himself with the people that he surrounded himself with. And, you know, Noah Dietrich always said that the problem with Howard was that he just he didn't know who to trust. And in the end, he wound up trusting all the wrong people. Like, you know, Dietrich was fired because Hughes became Hughes became paranoid about him, even though they had spent so much time together. And really, Noah Dietrich kept him afloat financially in a lot of these big ventures he was doing with like the Hercules and so forth. But as is generally the case, Hughes kind of turned on him and turned to people who were yes people. You know, Noah Dietrich wasn't a yes person. He would say, Howard, you're spending too much money. And then these other people would come into the situation and they would say, yes, Howard, we'll do whatever you want. We'll do this. We'll do that. It's which like may Michael not, Jackson. <laughs> which may not be the best thing you can have when you are so mentally... I don't want to say, yeah, fragile is the best way of putting it, I think. You know, sometimes you need people to say, Howard, no, you need to, this is not good. I was going to say, it's kind of like, you know, Elvis and Michael Jackson. They talk about the people that would say yes to them all the time. And yeah. the people that, that loved him and would set boundaries. They're, those are the ones you always get rid of, you know. And the yeah. thing about someone like Howard Hughes is he could afford to get rid of you if he didn't want you there, if you annoyed him or, you know, but... Because he's the boss. And it, it's sad because in the end, it does seem like these people just sort of kept him uh, physically alive as long as they could just to get as much money out of him before he just ceased to exist, you know, before his kidneys just failed and his heart just stopped. Because they obviously weren't really taking care of him. They were just keeping him physically going because the money's coming from him. You know what I mean? Um now, it seems to me the smarter thing to do would keep would be keep him healthy and then the money could come even longer. That's uh, what I would think, unless they thought he was going to set them up after death. But was there never like any investigation or charges brought against them? Or no, no. Surprisingly, like abuse and no, surprisingly, there wasn't. But I guess there is a great kind of irony, ultimately, because Howard didn't have a will. In the end. Oh my God. How is that even possible? I don't know. He did not have a will. Now, a, a very suspicious will turned up on the desk of one of the uh, higher ups in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And it was a handwritten will that gave them a bunch of money and gave other people a bunch of money. There was an investigation about this. That, that will was proven to be um, fraudulent. fraudulent. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. Yeah, right. So ultimately, what they discovered is Howard didn't have an actual will. Two point five uh, billion dollars he was worth when he died, and it Where was is a that time machine. <laughs> I tell you, it was a long time before they sorted out what to do. Eventually, that two point five billion was was uh, divided amidst twenty two of his cousins. So. 2.5 billion divided by 22, they still got a lot of money. Um, but, you know, and I don't, they probably didn't donate it to any of the organizations that were helping their, their, um, their cousin in, the, in his time of need. Uh, I mean, look, it, it's a sad story, and there are a lot of different ins and outs that you could take with it. In fact, it's kind of hard to, to boil it down into an hour show because there's so much. Um, and it's real interesting sometimes to think about Howard's quirks and all the things that, that, that he got into, you know, I was like when he was living in Vegas, one of the things was he was up in his penthouse and he was watching the local, um, 
uh, KLAS TV station. And uh, he bought. <laughs> yeah, he was watching it one night and he saw that movie, uh, I Station Zebra, and, and he fell asleep during the movie. And so the next day, he wanted them to rerun it, but I guess they wouldn't listen. So he bought the station and then just had them rerun it for him. I mean, so it's uh, interesting stories like that. I mean, Ryan lives in Vegas. I'm sure Vegas is full of Howard Hughes stories. I mean, there's another one that Liberace used to tell when he played at the Desert Inn, um, that he was on stage and he went back to tell someone uh, about a lighting cue. I want the lights to do this when I play this song. And, you know, he didn't realize that the guy standing there in these just ratty clothes wasn't the lighting director. It was Howard Hughes, the owner of the hotel. Until someone came over and said, oh, Liberace, that's, that's Howard Hughes. I mean, so there are a lot of stories you know, like that. Um, it's funny, too, that TV station. The story is back in the old days in, in Vegas that if Howard got on a kick about a movie late at night, he would have them play that movie over and over and over again just for him. So I guess if you turned on the TV late at night, you could see what Howard was really into because they would play this movie over and over again after everyone else had gone to sleep. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I, we kind of lost you there, Ryan. We... Yeah. I, uh, I, I think I'm like, so stuck when you guys ever the, the thing earlier and came back. It's like a, it's like a vowels. We only get in vowels. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not good either. But anyway, the, but that was what I was talking about, about, you know, just sort of the, the quirky Howard Hughes stories. There's, uh, you know, uh, like I said, he had many love affairs in his Hollywood days. One of them was with Ava Gardner, who was, he was really fond of. The old story, the old yeah. story is that uh, when Ava Gardner was, was dating Johnny Stompanato, who was a mafia type, uh, who wound up with Lana Turner, and that's a whole other show in and of yeah. itself. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there but the story was um howard hughes used to hire a private investigator to follow ava gardner to give information to frank sinatra who really loved ava gardner and about johnny stompanato so that way he would she would turn howard was trying to turn ava gardner against Frank Sinatra so that she, he could swoop in and rescue her <laughs> from Johnny Stappanato and Frank Sinatra. So he had all these like little, little uh, obsessions and Ava Gardner was one of them. Um, and of course, the, the famous one is Catherine Hepburn, who he had uh, a very long uh, relationship with. And I don't think either of them ever really talked about I mean, he didn't talk about anything past a certain point, but I don't think Kate Hepburn really talked about him too much. Uh, it was a part of her life that she probably uh, wanted to keep private. And she also probably, because she, you know, probably also had a respect for him, you know. Yes, he was. You know, I'm surprised he didn't feel more trusting of her in his later years, going, well, she never sold me out or anything. That's true, Yeah. And if you think about it, a lot of his Hollywood friends, the friends that you would think would sell him out in terms of, you know, the many love affairs he had, not really a lot of them did. They sort of kept mum about Howard Hughes. It was a different uh, time. <laughs> Every thousand a year. That's right. And he became, uh, and uh, you know, there are a lot of stories about, you know, because Hughes supported Nixon during his early runs. And Hughes financed a lot of Nixon's run against JFK um, in the 60s. So, you know, there is, the world, I think, is, is full of Howard Hughes stories. Because he, he sort of, like I say, you could do many, many hours on him because it branches off into politics and aviation and movies and love affairs. And, but sadly, it ended badly. And, it, you know, it's, it's a shame because he was a really brilliant man and invented all kinds of amazing things that we still take advantage of nowadays. Yeah. So on that uplifting note, I guess we'll say <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad I had uh, you guys here with me for this show. Um, Ryan, thanks for coming on, man. No 
problem. And Sorry, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, could I have better connection, but. Yeah, well, it's what good. Happened. You never know on these kind of shows what the connections are going to be like. And we've had waterfalls and coughing and all kinds <laughs> of crazy <laughs> shit going on. So, but we made it through Howard Hughes. We made it through Howard yeah. Hughes. He, it, that was probably what it was in the background. It was him in the background. It was Howard Hughes saying, Ryan, why do you have so much blood in your face? Get away from me. Germs. Yes. yes. And he kept coughing the germs away. I, 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 I washing hear. his hands over and over. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would have held, held him up on the spot. It would be like 70, 70 rats a year. <laughs> Or there's going to be more. I'll cut myself out. I think it's safe to say that any of the three of us would have taken better care of Howard Hughes. Than, exactly. Than the people that took care of him. But anyway, Rebecca, um, thank you yes. as well uh -huh. for being a part of the show. And it was it was great fun. And next week we'll be back with some more interesting stuff. And until then, take care of yourselves.